One of the things that makes some prospectors more successful than others is that they understand a little bit about how gold deposits form. Because that can help you know where the deposits are going to be whether you're looking for hard rock or placer. And you don't have to be the world's leading geologist in economic gold deposits, but understanding a little bit about how they form will make you a better prospector and a more successful one. So we're gonna dive into that right now. We're getting on to how gold forms deposits. Now, gold deposits, you gotta think of it, because it's, it's not a natural way to think of things, that Gold deposits are almost always, like the vast majority, like 98%, 99% of all gold deposits are formed when hot water dissolves gold. And you think, gold, gold doesn't dissolve in water. I know this, right? Well, in, you know, at room temperature, you, you know, drop your gold ring into a cup of tap water. Yeah, the gold is not going to dissolve. But if you take... Uh, really hot like way above boiling so you know if you're talking in Fahrenheit maybe 400 degrees or if you're talking in Celsius maybe 200 degrees you're talking way above the boiling point of water but if you keep water under pressure it won't boil it'll stay a liquid if you keep it under pressure and and then you add sulfur to that you know you have hot a little bit acidic sulfury waters and that will dissolve gold to a certain extent. And it's a natural process of sulfur plus water plus heat and pressure that forms gold deposits. And so let's talk about the basics of gold deposits, some of which form very deep in the earth, some of which are within a half mile of the surface, but a lot of them are deeper than that. Some are three, five, even as deep as 10 miles below the surface. Let's talk about the geology of how natural gold deposits form. Perhaps the easiest way to explain the natural process for forming a gold deposit is with a diagram like this. This is what would be an epithermal type gold and silver vein system. And at the bottom in that kind of salmon pinky color is uh, represented a shallow intrusive heat source. So intrusive rock that had been molten uh, has come close to the surface, but not enough to you know, cool quickly, not enough to erupt on the surface, but enough that it's providing heat to drive a system. And up above, you see a line that uh, materials going up a black line, and that would be like some sort of fault zone. And so the intrusive heat source would provide the heat, the water, whatever water came off the heat source or whatever sulfur came off the heat source would come off. And then uh, water circulating the white arrows show that the water comes down and uh, circulates up. And it, it's basically a convection type system. Heat at the bottom, heat rises, the water that's in the system goes up. And uh, with the sulfur and the the hot water under pressure, it strips traces of gold out of the adjoining rock. And then as it gets closer to the surface, it cools and the gold and silver and, you know, deeper down base metals are deposited in the veins. And then eventually the surface is eroded and exposed. And then the, once the surface is eroded and you get down a few hundred meters, you can see the veins on the surface because the the surface during the formation has been eroded away. And the surface would look like this, the hot springs. I took this picture in Yellowstone a couple years ago, but the water would eventually come out onto the surface and look something very much like this. But the truth is not all uh, gold and silver deposits form in hot springs type of systems. Uh, that's, like I say, the nearest surface type of stuff. And in this kind of diagram, that's the stuff that's near the surface on the right-hand uh, side of the diagram. You can see the epithermals are the ones that form 
not basically very near to the surface but there are deeper ones porphyry and scarn type and replacement type form a little deeper down uh, this is in the range of one two three kilometers below the surface and there's also other type of reduced intrusion related type of deposits including carlin and some others that form a few kilometers down and then the deepest of all is the orogenic which is basically the the mother load type of deposit but a green belt type of deposit that uh, you find in um, Australia, West Africa, California mother load and, and some of the things like that where it's a, a formed uh, deeper down as a part of the mountain building process as the tectonic plates collide. And these deeper ones, like the orogenic and even some of the other ones, the scarn and that sort of thing, don't necessarily have any surface, uh, you know, ex exposure that shows that it's forming underneath. Uh, and, you know, the the hot springs type, yes, there's hot springs on the surface, but the deeper down ones are deep enough that there may be nothing on the surface that shows. So I want to put this all together with what we're going to call favorable rock types and these are where you have the right conditions of faulting and different rock types rocks that can contribute small amounts of gold to the formation of a, a natural gold deposit and the idea of favorable rock types is something that's essential for successful prospecting you know if you understand where the gold deposits are supposed to be because of the geology of the area hey you know where they're supposed to be. So you can go out and look in that area. So let's talk about favorable rock types, how all of this works together, the geology, the uh, how gold deposits form, and, and then understanding how you can go out in the field and find more gold for yourself. So let's dig into that right now. Now we've talked about hot sulfury waters moving through and stripping the gold out of some rocks and then redepositing it in a natural concentration uh, but rock uh, is hard to flow through you know you really have to have some break in the rock in order for the water to flow and a lot of times what is that break in the rock is a fault zone and so when you have faults move, you can open up spaces like this. It may not be an obvious space like shown in this drawing, but you still can open up a zone for liquids to be able to flow where it can't flow through just solid, unbroken rock. In this example, you see a dark colored volcanic rock that intruded some light colored granitic rock and just forced its way through opening up a crack. And this was a fault or break in the rock that allowed the, the dark colored magma to squeeze its way in there. And it's not unusual that even after these uh, volcanic rocks have intruded, you may on the edges of the volcanic rock find gold mineralization and quartz and that sort of thing. Uh, it's not directly uh, a thing, but it's the fact that there's an open space for these hot liquids to circulate and then deposit. And where there was space for the volcanic rock to intrude, and there'll also be a crack or a space that the gold-bearing solutions could intrude. Even the famous Comstock load was emplaced along a fault between two different kinds of rock. On the left-hand side, you have a granular diorite, which is a, a granitic type of rock. And then on the right-hand side, you have a diabase and some andesite, which are both volcanic types of rock. So where there was a fault joining them, water circulated and created the great Comstock load. Now, I wish I could tell you that every time you have two different kinds of rock with a fault zone separating them, that there's just automatically going to be a gold deposit. It's just not that easy. I wish I could tell you that, but it's simply not true. In fact, it's not even true that most of the time you'll have a gold deposit. Sometimes, yes, but most of the time or all the time, no, it's not that easy. The problem is you have to learn what the favorable rock types and favorable situations are for the areas you're going to prospect in. What works in Nevada or works in a northern Nevada isn't necessarily going to work in northern California. What works in Arizona 
isn't necessarily going to work in northern Nevada or northern California. What works in Alaska isn't going to work in Arizona. So you've got to kind of, and it isn't even a state by state thing. It's a district by district. So what works in one district in California may not work in another district in California. So you have to study the geology of the individual gold district that you're going to hunt. But if you can figure this out, it will give you a huge leg up in Northern California. Not all, some, a lot of the, some of the gold is associated with just fault zones that go through the rock, but a lot of the gold is associated with a a contact fault zone that's between a rock called serpentine that I've colored here in green and various uh, metamorphic rocks like slate and schist and, and that sort of thing that I've marked here in purple. And uh, here, let me show you some serpentine. Serpentine is a greenish to greenish gray, a kind of waxy looking rock, uh, sometimes with little you know, striations in it. This example shows more of the striations and more of the gray coloration and the waxy kind of appearance than the previous example. But, you know, that waxy, the striations, the greenish, greenish gray, that's very typical of serpentine. And in a lot of the Northern California gold country, it's a really positive thing to find. On the other hand, if you're looking for gold in Arizona, you're going to have a completely different situation. You wouldn't want to bother looking for serpentine. Instead, you're looking for some really old schist areas and a lot of times near where there's granitic intrusions close to the schist. And if you're looking in greenstone belt areas, well, you're going to be looking for greenstone, green schist like this rock. It just depends on where you're at and how the gold occurs in the area that you're searching. This means you have to learn a little bit about the geology for the particular area where you want to prospect. And as I also showed you in this picture, you know, when you're looking for a certain type of rock, that that's the rock that's going to have the gold deposits, it can be weathered on the surface and may not look exactly like a textbook example of the rock when it's unweathered. Like say, this is a greenstone area and this is actually a a gold deposit that was worked in West Africa. All this area has been stirred up because it had gold. So wherever you end up prospecting, whatever country or state you're going to be looking for gold in, knowing the origin of the gold, understanding a little bit of how natural gold deposits form, and then how that system worked, how it worked in your neck of the woods, that's going to be the thing that gives you the big advantage. Now, wherever you're hunting and in whatever rock types you're hunting and in whatever geologic contacts or faults or intrusions, whatever is forming gold deposits in your area, whatever gold deposits you're looking for, what you know makes a huge difference. And I hope you understood more about this. What you know makes a huge difference. And to impart to you the skills of going out and finding gold for yourself, uh, to basically uh, give you a, a head start with my you know, 40 plus years of prospecting plus my degree in mining engineering, I wrote a book. It's called Fistful of Gold because I want you to go out and find a fistful of gold. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about my book right now because I think that it could really be helpful to you. So a little bit more about my book. This is my book, Fistful of Gold. And like I say, it's an encyclopedia of prospecting. And you know, if you want to go out and find your own nuggets, you want to go find your own gold, you want to be successful, well, it's about what you know. Uh, the guys who are finding gold, they have a knowledge. It's a skill. You know, I sometimes compare it to like being an electrician. It just buying a voltmeter at Home Depot doesn't make you a journeyman electrician. and Having a sluice box or a metal detector or a gold pan doesn't make you a successful prospector. It's about what you know, right? And that's why I wrote this book. Like I say, it's an encyclopedia. It has stuff that really is um, for beginners. It has stuff that's for mid-level guys that have learned the basics and want to learn more. And it has even some more advanced things for guys that have some experience but want to learn even more. And 
I've actually run into people in the field where uh, they tell me something and I say, well, that's a pretty advanced concept. Where'd you learn that? And then they said, I read your book. So, you know, it has a real high rating on Amazon and it's available either from Amazon or from High Plains. Now, High Plains prospectors, uh, they're an outfit that's a mail order prospecting equipment dealer. They have everything you can imagine from, you know, a simple gold pan through basic metal detectors all the way to high-end metal detectors and other stuff. Uh, if you need it for the prospecting games, High Plains has it. And uh, it, it, you can get a discount code with them. You know, if you order something from them, use the discount code Chris Ralph. It's C H R I S R E L P H in all caps, no space in between Chris and Ralph. And you can get a discount off of what you're buying from them. And then they have my book. You can get my book from them. Uh, and so they're really great guys. And I've dealt with them for a while. And I'm happy to recommend them because. Like I say, they're good dudes. So if you want to learn more about prospecting, consider my book, Fistful of Gold. And be sure to take a look at my uh, YouTube episodes. I've got lots of videos and lots of information on YouTube. And, you know, I oftentimes get people say, hey, Chris, why don't you make a video on XYZ, right? And it's like 90% of the time, it's like, I already have a video on XYZ. Uh, take a look. And so if you're interested, Look at my back catalog of videos because there's a lot of good information there. And we'll see you in the next video.